Um, our next presenter is um, will be speaking on living donation, giving a kidney, and um, av and advocating for a kidney. Um, this will be our um, coming to you from Matt Cavanaugh. He is NKDO's um, president and CEO and a non-direct kidney donor. Um, Matt is the president and CEO of the National Kidney Donation Organization. He uh, is a retired U.S. Army strategist. He is also a non-direct kidney donor. He can explain that to you if you uh, don't understand what that means. He is also a professional uh, practice with Arizona State University, co-founder of and senior fellow with the Martin Moore Institute at West Point, and has twice earned the Bronze Star Medal as well as a Combat Action Badge for his service in Iraq. Thank you very much for your service. Matt donated his left kidney on September 15, 2021 to a stranger and started a donation chain. Unlike many donors who already have someone in need of a kidney, Matt simply learned how many are in need of a kidney and decided to donate. Thank you again so much. Well, please welcome Matt Cavanaugh. Hey, hey everybody, it's, it's, it's nice to be here. Um, virtually, I would prefer in real life, but this is what we have. I'm calling you from Utah, um, and I know you guys are all over the place, uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to this. Um, first, uh, the organization that I'm blessed to lead, the National Kidney Donation Organization, um, we're primarily a mentorship organization, which is to say a group of living donors that talk to people that are considering living donation. Um, and we know that that has a big impact on people's uh, decision to donate. Um, and typically because they have a conversation who's had a success with someone who's had a successful donation, uh, they tend to become donors. Um, and so I just want you to better understand just a tiny bit uh, our organization. And I'm just going to kick off by saying, I know that some of you listening right now need kidneys. And I want you to get to know uh, one non-directed donor, uh, which is to say that I donated my kidney to a stranger. Um, you know, it was a stranger. I uh, was still in, active in the army at the time um, in 2021. Uh, my procedure, my transplant surgery was very early in the morning because the kidney had to board a plane to go from the Washington DC area to someone in Seattle. And it kicked off a chain that helped another seven folks receive the kidneys that they needed. And the last person on the chain was back at Walter Reed. Um, so that's just a tiny bit of context. And I want to start with a thought um, that kidney donation is a two-way gift. It extends to a recipient, but it also reflects back onto a donor. Um, and I want to uh, I'm going to give you a, a PowerPoint presentation. I, I apologize, um, but I feel like this is sort of the best way that I can um, help you better understand my experience. Um, this talk is entitled How Kidney Donation Amplified My Life. Um, and I want to start by saying I, I wasn't sort of dead per se, but I felt like my life had flatlined uh, before my kidney donation. Uh, Jackie Robinson, the baseball player that broke the color line in Major League Ball, his tombstone reads, a life is not important except in the impact it has on other lives. And when your life isn't having much of an impact on others, you can feel incredibly unimportant. Uh, and before my donation, that's where I was. And I'm going to illustrate that today uh, with a couple of snapshots, two stories from before my donation and two stories from after my donation. And I'm actually, I literally marked the slides before donation and after donation. And at moments, it'll seem a little bit like Ebenezer Scrooge and his ghosts and glimpses of past, present, and future. There's risk in presenting someone's life in such small doses. Obviously, there's at least a little more to my life than just these four episodes alone. But in the interest of time, I think this is the best way to take you inside four moments of my life because I think they'll help you spot the really positive impact that kidney donation has had on my life. Um, so the story starts in May of 2003, uh, something I later reflected on and wrote on uh, and connected to my donation. I wrote about it in the Los Angeles Times. And the image that you see on screen right now is from that day's newspaper. While I know that you all can read, uh, you can tell that the print is very, very, very small. 
Um, and so putting it into my own voice might help. So here's the story from May of 2003. Quote, I had fired every bullet and it wasn't enough. On a black night in late spring 2003, west of Baghdad, I was a single lieutenant defending our cavalry squadron's position. A team of insurgents advanced toward me firing and tracers lit the air around me. I felt utterly, deeply alone. And then relief. When my life depended on it, someone came for me. The squadron's response unit arrived and turned back the attack. And 18 years later, I got to pay that moment forward. I was the cavalry for someone. I saved someone's life and then some. Now, if I'm being honest, that moment was actually worse than the way that I wrote it. While I tro tried to control my rate of fire, I ran out of ammo. I ran out of bullets. I heard the click, the last round in the last magazine. And I thought to myself, that was it. Then someone, actually several someones in a truck, this was still very early on, so we weren't using up armored vehicles. I still don't know who they were, but they saved my life. Uh, there was too much to do then to go and track down those guys and say thank you. But the more I think about it, the more I realize how lucky I was, not just then, but at several other moments of my life. And if my time in combat taught me anything, it's that even the best of us can lose life's lottery. Some of the best die first, and it's through no fault of their own. And when we're at our best as human beings, our highest calling is to risk something of ourselves for others. So let's jump to December 2014. So this is 11 years later after that last moment. This one is actually really hard for me. Um, that you're looking at a picture of my older daughter, Grace, uh, in the emergency room after her first seizure and my wife, Rachel, trying to keep her calm in the body brace. Uh, it was, frankly, our worst nightmare. And it's really hard for me to even look at now. And then somehow that moment got worse. Uh, a few weeks later, I got unaccompanied orders to Korea, which meant I had to go by myself. And that I had to leave Rachel, my wife, with a newborn, our younger daughter, Georgina, and Grace's new seizure condition. So she dealt with ER visits for the entire year while I was gone with a newborn in tow, all alone. Uh, and when I got back, one night we're sitting at the dinner table and all of a sudden, Rach starts asking Grace questions about numbers and colors. And I'm the last one to realize what's happening. Grace was starting a seizure and I didn't know it. Uh, so Rach starts telling me what to do. Carry Grace to the couch, lay her down on her side. And while I'm doing that, I can see Grace starting to drift and she couldn't control herself. She went limp uh, and started shaking. It was the height of helplessness. Like I was just sitting there watching her drown and doing nothing. And the worst part by far was not knowing what to do. If it wasn't for my wife, Rachel, she got our, th our family through the worst of the worst. And I was so grateful, and I still am so grateful to be married to someone so competent, capable, and caring. At the same time, I felt like, frankly, a complete failure as a father for, not, for being gone for so long and not knowing what to do. So going into my donation, Several years later in 2021, when I go back and gather up these and other breadcrumbs, I had this profound feeling that so many people had done so much for me, not just the combat experience, but I have exceptional parents. I've benefited from wonderful uh, teachers and mentors, and my amazing wife literally gave everything to care for our daughter. So I would look in the mirror and I would ask, what am I doing? Like, what, what's my contribution? So on September 15th, 2021, I donated my left kidney at Walter Reed. Like I mentioned, it boarded a plane, went to Seattle. It went to my recipient, still unknown to me, and kickstarted that chain of donations that helped another seven folks, the last one coming back to Walter Reed. And my donation energized me. There wasn't an exact moment, but I felt like someone yelled clear and hit me with those paddles. Um, 
you can see the discharge paperwork, by the way, from Walter Reed uh, telling me not to run for six months. Um, I still think that maybe they were messing with me by writing that I could, uh, quote, march in place. Uh, I, I think that was a joke. I don't know, like it seems like a joke to me, but that's what they wrote. Um, so the reason that I point this discharge paperwork out to you is that um, at that moment after I got off the the table uh, after the surgery, I, like I said, I felt good, like uh, empowered. Um, and I had learned that a survey of Americans found that 75% have the belief that to to donate a kidney is to become degraded physically post donation like you kind of shrivel up and become a prune after you donate a kidney and like to me that was bullshit it is bullshit and so i wanted to show what you could do uh, after you donate a kidney now when I was younger in life, I grew up kind of hating running. I, I I played hockey when I was younger. I'm from Minnesota. That's a stereotype that's accurate. Um, but later on in life, I, I picked up running and uh, I learned to love it, to enjoy it. Um, and every year uh, I, I, you know, in the last, I don't know, 15 years, I've done this one long race that goes six days and 120 miles total, um, about 20 miles a day, and it's supported. So like you don't have to carry, it's like racing six days in a row. You don't have to carry any equipment. Um, so after my donation, I said, well, if so many people believe that you're degraded physically post-donation, then maybe I ought to try doing an event that clearly demonstrates way more than I've ever done before. So what I did was I signed up for an event series called Racing the Planets Four Deserts Grand Slam. So it's four events, 155 miles each, six days each, but self-supported, meaning you carry all your gear and calories in a backpack. And that pack is about 20 to 25 pounds and it's through some of the world's toughest deserts. So the Namib Desert in Namibia, the Gobi in Mongolia, the Atacama in Chile and Antarctica. And yes, Antarctica uh, does technically receive so little precipitation that it's often called the last desert or the white desert. So to take on that schedule would mean racing five times the amount of miles I, I'd ever raced before um, in much uh, tougher uh, weather than I had ever done before. Um, so the first event was seven months post donation. So from surgery to racing, seven months. Um, and I started to build confidence during my recovery. At the six month mark post donation, I ran 83 miles in just three days of training. So I started asking myself, am I more than I was before? Uh, and that's when I hit an enormous wall at the first event. Um, so this is the Namib race in the Namib desert. And it was the hardest race I'd ever done in my life. And you're looking at a picture from stage three. That's May 3rd of 2022. So again, that's seven months post donation. Uh, so this is at the finish of the race's third stage. And I remember stumbling across the finish line and people pulling my shoes off. And you know something's wrong in your life when people are pulling your shoes off. Uh, one got stuck and Daniel, the Israeli, uh, former Israeli army guy, uh, gave it a hard pull and it came off and so did my sock. And when the shoe came up, uh, I looked up and recognized another runner who had come in ahead of me. And I tried to speak. I tried to say something. And that's when the pitcher of water uh, coated my face. Uh, they actually poured gallons of water on me to sort of cool me down. I wasn't the only one um, because that's when a race official told me how hot it was outside, 131 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which is 55 degrees Celsius. At that moment, I knew why I was so hot. I was literally the frog uh, in the boiling pot, the last one to figure out that he was in the boiling pot. 
So that was the end of stage three, my third day of racing in the Namib desert, seven months post donation. At that point, I still had 21 more racing stages to go uh, to finish the Grand Slam. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I felt like as awful as that experience was, it was empowering in that one fourth of the runners that signed up for the event had to drop out of the event due to the extreme heat. And another runner from Miami who had done many of these events before actually pulled out of the event because he couldn't pee, uh, which is, you know, to suggest that his kidneys weren't functioning properly. So here I was out there seven months post donation on my one kidney and I was able to make it and finish fourth. And, you know, another runner had to drop um, because, because he just couldn't, couldn't hold on. Um, so I'm, I'm going to fast forward a lot in June. I raced the Caucasus in the former Soviet Georgia. Uh, that was a replacement race for the Gobi desert because no, the Mongolians weren't letting anyone in the country in September. I raced the Atacama desert in Chile. I finished third place in both. And then in late November, I raced Antarctica. Um, it was, sort of crazy. I saw a Gen 2 penguin attack a Hungarian dentist and a cop from Abu Dhabi came to the dentist's aid. So it was a sort of a bizarre experience. Um, that's how bizarre and surreal the last desert race in Antarctica was. But I I won. I won the, the event. Um, and uh, when I step back and sum up the year, you know, kind of from the scorpions in Namibia to the penguins in Antarctica. Um, I feel incredibly proud about the race um, because in the series is 20 years. They've had 10,000 runners from 100 countries that have finished an event. Um, 300 have joined the four deserts club by finishing all the events, but only 80 have finished all the four events in one year. Um, and I was the first to grand slam it, to do all those events on one kidney. I won the last desert and I'm now actually the fastest American to ever race the four deserts. So I did it. I made it, you know, a thousand kilometers of sand and sludge, rock and snow. I made it, but that stuff pales absolutely in comparison to the people I connected with along the way. So the phone call that I had with uh, legendary ultra runner, Dean Carnazis. Uh, known as the ultra marathon man whose running exploits actually got me interesting, interested in running in the first place. We talked on the phone and if there was ever a moment in my life when the mic dropped, it was hearing him say that he thought that I was brave or imagine that you're me for a moment and you're running across the Atacama desert, the world's highest and driest, and you're really starting to fade. And right then you get an unexpected email through the racist system from a guy in Montana who's a don about to be a donor. And he writes, you are an inspiration. I hope this message gives you some strength because you have done that time and again without even knowing me. Or you're struggling to hold on to win a race in Antarctica, holding on with your fingernails. And a 19-year-old, soon to be a donor, writes, I have been following your racing adventure for quite a while now. You have had a huge influence on me or Anam, the women's champion in the series, who has multiple Ironmans under her belt. On the very last day of the very last race of the entire year in Antarctica, I happened to be nearby when she fell, and we later learned that that fall broke her hand. So there was a Japanese runner who was right behind me in that race in Antarctica, and I swear to you, I was doing everything I possibly could to hold him off. Um, so I had a choice when Anam fell. You know, uh, do I do I just keep running to hold on my, to my lead or do I stop? And honestly, seeing how bad the fall was, it wasn't much of a choice. I stopped. And after the race, she sent me the message that I put on screen. And it meant far more, way more to me than any bit of time I lost in that moment. So it's those small moments, uh, those reminders that once you suspended self-interest for the greater good that pushed me for that year. You can't stay mad at yourself for too long or down for so long when the world doesn't let you. That's the superpower I found on the other side of kidney donation. Because even when you feel like you're fading away, others always see the better in you. You are human, so you still lose it momentarily. I lose, lose it all the time. 
Uh, but others remind me who I can be, who I ought to be, and they reflect it back on me when I need it most. Um, I've learned so much from this last year, from the kidney donation, through running and racing across the planet, um, you know, with, with maybe an upgraded body, mind, and spirit. I've thought a lot about the experience and how it might matter to others uh, on their way to the next checkpoint. And this is the sort of sum, summary thought that I come to, that there's so much power in giving. Everyone focuses on what you lose in a kidney donation, on what you've given up. They rarely see what's gained, the psychological strength that comes from the knowledge that you've done something remarkable for someone else. I've never felt more like a part of something bigger than myself than in kidney donation. The permanent mental benefits far outweigh any temporary physical cost. Kidney donation isn't about subtraction, it's addition and multiplication. Never forget that when you ask someone for a kidney, you are giving that person a powerful gift, the opportunity to be brave and selfless. And that is a very rare gift. And I know because I've felt it, it's empowered me. It pushed me all of last year. And I hope that you can see that now too. So I'm going to uh, just say thank you so much for the invitation. I know that this was a relatively short uh, talk, um, but I, I would open up the floor to any questions you might have uh, for me uh, personally or in my capacity with uh, the National Kidney Donation Organization. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. You really are truly an inspiration. I, I don't run. So um, unless someone's chasing me. So but I, certainly, I think it's fantastic. Some of the stuff that you, you've been able to do. Um, and you're right. You're absolutely right. Um, I, I hear it all the time. You know, oh, even from patients saying, I don't want to ask anybody. I don't want I don't want uh, I feel that they'll be hurt by donating kidneys, even though they actually have already offered. And I think it's all it's very important to let everyone know that you're not being hurt by by a giving. Um, and as you said, it, it is it is worth giving. And um, I, it's very important. You, sh you should know, by the way, my uh, uh, a senior figure in our organization um, also a non-directed donor in, in the state of the great state of Illinois reminds me, uh, Matt, uh, I just run errands. I don't run, I run errands. Um, <laughs> no, but, uh, and, and donors are everybody, you know, donors, we have librarians, we have gardeners, chefs, uh, cops, firefighters. Um, you know, uh, I just happen to be a runner. That's mm -hmm. my sort of thing. Right. Um, but you know, donors are everybody. So absolutely. Does anyone else have any questions for Matt? Matt, I am, I'm Cher and I'm with the Renal Support Network. Nice to meet you. My husband was an army guy as well. So thank you for your service. Great Lori you. and I, Lori Hartwell and I are both the beneficiary of living donors, living related donors. And I've known people, I've been fortunate enough to know people that have done, um, a non-directed donation, right? And they've found it very rewarding. If someone in the audience was going to talk to somebody about that, um, how do you start the conversation? What do you say? So I've never been in that position. Um, so I'm, I'm obviously, I, I, it's, it's almost like a nun teaching sex ed, um, except to say that, uh, I know that there are people, a lot of more people out there that are willing to donate than, than you think. And you never, you'll never know who might say yes. Um, my organization uh, has uh, 3,000 members, over 1,000 of which are living donors. And I, I assure you, those 1,000 pe people, uh, the closest thing to a common thread that we have is that most of them are also blood donors, but they walk every walk in life. Um, I, I meant what I said. Some of them are runners. Most of them are not. Uh, they do they do anything and everything. And so I would I would hold it in your mind that uh, you will you will never know who might say yes until you ask the question. So there's always the possibility of a yes on the other side. And the second thing that I would emphasize is that. Um, it's a gift to ask the question that the donor receives just as much as the recipient. 
it has been a, a powerful, uh, it's been like a second wind in my life. And I, I, like, I mean that every ounce of it. So. I can't agree more. I know my brother was, um, he always told people how, what a gift it was. He wanted to help me some way. And so I would really like for people in the audience today to really take that with them that it is scary asking. It was the scariest question I ever asked. But, you know, it really is a gift to someone to give them a chance to help you. And this is a unique way of helping somebody. So, Matt, thank you so much uh, for your presentation today. I think that you have inspired us all, not just in donation, but in your physical recovery and your physical abilities and um, your dedication. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your time. And and uh, uh, please feel free to reach out if there are any other uh, questions on down the line. I look forward to uh you know, seeing more of the the week. What a what a great week for hope. And a shout out to our corporate mission partners for making this happen.